All right, so to chapter five, uh, we're doing Aristotle. The name of the chapter is Reason and Nature. Uh, it's a pretty apt title. And I hope you figure out why towards the end of the lecture. But let's talk about uh, Aristotle. I'll talk about how I usually do it. Talk about his life, a quick like historical bi biography um, about his life. And I'm gonna talk about his uh, his logic, his his epistemology, metaphysics, and then we'll end up with his ethics, which is called virtue ethics now. All right. um, but to begin with, Aristotle is uh, huge. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about him before, but he's big because um, the influence he made. Uh, he's one of those uh, very few super smart guys or humans uh, that we get maybe every once every millennia or something, right? or every two millennia, to be more exact, right? Um, like after Aristotle, things were totally different and things were like he was like the stamp he made on our intellectual tradition in the West uh, was so intense and so deep that we have to actually unlearn Aristotle. Uh, to go beyond <laughs> what he found out, to move forward in our philosophy, uh, philosophical tradition in the West. So that's how important Aristotle was. That for 2,000 years or so, his logic was his, his system of logic, which we'll get into right now, was thought of as complete, perfect. Right? It wasn't until like World War II around there, right? Wittgenstein and his people, the positivists, that really uh, logic took another leap forward. But for 2,000 years, this was it. Aristotle. The same you could say about politics, really, and poetics, really, the poetry. His book, Poetics, it still is a very useful and very uh, utilized, highly utilized by scholars of literary criticism, his poetics. So he's really important as like a foundational, uh, this foundation of what we know as science, really. It's Aristotle. It begins with Aristotle. So as I mentioned, before Aristotle was um, the teacher, uh, the, the student uh, of Plato. So Plato was Aristotle's teacher. And you'll see how widely different these two thinkers are. So to recap really quickly from chapter four, uh, Plato, the really real, right? He has this, this, this idea of the forms, capital F, and he talks about the, this world of the physical particular and then the world of the forms, the universal, eternal, perfect forms. Right? Whereas these, uh, these are like the models, right? Uh, these uh, templates of what the particulars are only imperfect uh, copies, I guess, right? physical copies. So we have this, this split, right? Pretty much it's, it's kind of like a mind-body split, right? The rationalist and the empiricist split. Aristotle rejects that split. Aristotle rejects the idea of the forms. Right? He believes Aristotle believes that the forms are this different mathematical phenomenon, right? but it's not really what's in front of us. Right? So, needless to say, right, cut to the chase here. Aristotle is a hardcore empiricist, whereas his teacher Plato, right, uh, he was a hardcore rationalist. It's all about the mind. Right? Like what we have here is a world of shadows, right? It's a cave, right? It's a darkness. And we got to use a rationality, not our senses, but a rationality to transcend this pseudo reality and go into the really real. Right? This is Plato, right? We're just recapping the idea of the forms here. Aristotle was like, nah, that's, the cave is cool. Just got to turn on the lights and look at the particulars around you, and we'll find out what's truth. Right? As a matter of fact, Aristotle is. Uh, 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 famous for having quote said that uh, he loved Plato, he loved his teacher, but he loved the truth more. So even though he was highly influenced by Plato, or he was his teacher, he differed and he went his own intellectual trajectory, which is still with us today. So Aristotle is pretty fucking awesome, right? So. Uh, so like I said, his discourses on ethics, on politics, on poetry, and on logic, right, were like the the end word, were the ultimate word, were the authority for about 2,000 years. It's a long fucking time. Uh, 2,000 years. The Aristotle was the end all be all of these uh, disciplines, right? politics, ethics, 
poetry, logic. Um, as a matter of fact, we're going to read about St. Thomas Aquinas, medieval philosopher, this theologian. And he just simply called, he didn't care about any other philosopher. He just cared about Aristotle. And he just simply called Aristotle the philosopher, the philosophos. That's it. That's all, you need, that's all you need to know about philosophy. It's just Aristotle, according to Aquinas. Um, but no, we're, we're learning about more than that, just Aristotle. I'm just kind of emphasizing how important Aristotle was. Okay. Uh, he invented what we know as formal logic. So think about way back in chapter one, right? Is this the form, validity, right? Uh, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true, right? Is this uh, modus ponens, modus tollens, all that formal logic, right? Of the form, right? The, the the structure, the logical structure of arguments. He invented that basically, right? the syllogism, the three statement argument. All men are more Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Right? The syllogism, right? These three statements, right? Two premises, one conclusion. He kind of like, that was his, like his main tool that he really uh, sharpened uh, to give us what we have as formal logic. <clears throat> um, what's more astonishing about Aristotle, right? It's not just how tremendously influential it was is that what we have left over are the the esoteric writings. So esoteric means uh, like the the cryptic, the hidden message, uh, the uh, the hard to understand writings, right? The writings that we have, and I have a little book of his. Uh, this is a really good book, Pocket Aristotle. It has the uh, most of it is it has the physics, psychology, metaphysics, Nicomachean ethics, politics, and poetics. It has like his main stuff. It's super cheap, it costs me like maybe 99 cents. It's a used book. Uh, Pocket Aristotle. <clears throat> uh, what we have here, right, these books here, these are just fragments, these are just really notes for his lectures when he was uh, lecturing in Athens, right? So he, uh, I'll go into his biography. Let me just finish this real quick. Uh, lecturing in Athens, <clears throat> right, in the Lyceum, his, his school that he founded in Athens um, after his, uh, after Plato died. Um, it's just the next lecture notes, and they're fucking hard to understand. It's not like Plato. Plato is a really good writer, and we have his uh, many of his books right, intact. His ex exoteric writings. These are writings that are meant not for the students, or advanced students in the Lyceum or the Academy, but more for the general public at large. Right? Exoteric instead of esoteric. Right? The dialectic there. Right, so esoteric is like the cryptic, right? You've got to be advanced. You're going to be uh, part of this community to understand a language. Right? That's where you got to take intro to philosophy before you take, right, uh, philosophy of religion or something like that, right? Or a more uh, upper level religion philosophy class. You're going to take ethics and intro to philosophy, and then you take the bigger, uh, harder classes, advanced classes, because you're, you got to understand the language, you got to understand the the game. Right, you understand the the playing field, right? uh, and that's what we have for Aristotle. Right? Is these lecture notes are just really hard to understand. Right? His uh, more exoteric writings, those that were meant for the general public, those are lost forever. Right? And that's astonishing because what we have, the little that we have, is fucking great. Imagine if we have everything around about him. We would have been way advanced and our ethics and politics and everything else than we are right now. All right. Uh, so, yeah. He wrote a lot, for sure. Uh, great man. Great, fantastic character. So let me get into his life. I've already started this. His life, I think, uh, to understand these philosophers, you can understand where they're coming from. right? And this is not, not just for philosophers, but everything you read, really. When you read something, look at, look at uh, research a little bit of the author. Right? Why? Where is he coming from? Where is he born? Where you know? What? What years? Right? That's really important. What's going on during that time period to understand where he's coming from? Right? This is really, really important when you're doing your research. Right? Different authors have different biases. These biases you've got to uh, exonerate and look at and investigate and judge. Really, you got to make a judgment right, on these biases of these authors. And you can't make a judgment if you don't know what they're coming from. Right? So that's why I put a lot of emphasis 
on the on a historical sketch or historical biography of these philosophers that we go into this class. So the life of Aristotle. He was born in this uh, border town, uh, border city, I guess we call it, not a town, kind of big back then even for standards. Uh, Stagira, uh, on the border between uh, northern Athens and Macedonia. So this is the Mediterranean Sea. There's Athens, like a little like man kind of island looking thing. And then they stretch, the mainland stretches and it goes into like Constantinople and Turkey. Then right here, like in between northern uh, Greece and then into the east, Middle East, right? Constantinople, Turkey, right? or Asia Minor back then. Macedonia. Right? So between Macedonia and Greece, right in the border between there. Stagida. Uh, what year was it? 384? Uh, before the Common Era. Right? So over 2,000 years ago, right? Um, he was uh, the son of a physician, of a doctor. His mother was also a doctor or like some kind of nurse. Uh, mother uh, Phaestis, P-H-A-E-S-T-I-S. -E His mother Phaestis was a family, uh, well, comes from a family of doctors. And his father, Nicomachus, that's his name, the father, who's also the name of his son, Aristotle's son later on, was the court physician for the Macedonian king. Uh, so comes from a very, very wealthy family, very well off, right? Uh, and his parents were expecting him to pick up on the family uh, career, right? On, on the family um, duty of becoming doctors. But instead, he uh, somehow hooked up with Plato's Academy in Athens, and he went down there and devoted his whole life to philosophy and not just medicine. But nonetheless, his father was a really uh, was a good doctor, right? The, the, the doctor for the court of the king of Macedonia. And we'll see why that is, that's important right now in a little bit. Uh, his mother also comes from a family of doctors, so he's, he's, <clears throat> he's used to that, right? This is... Uh, you know, doctors, they get in there, right, and they, they cut you up, right? Maybe they have to, right, biopsies or whatever, right, and if you're sick, right? The surgeons, right, they got to cut you up or they cut off your limb to save your life, right? He's in there, like, in the particular, like, in the real flesh, you want to say it. It's not like Plato, where he's out there about the forms, right? Aristotle comes from this background where it's like, it's in your face if you want to find out how to save a life or not. It's not just the fucking forms out there, right? And that's a big impact. I argue that's a big impact of his upbringing, right, <clears throat> and to his uh, later uh, intellectual trajectory. Uh, so he decides to go to Plato Academies. He stayed there for 20 years. <laughs> so if you're uh, taking a long time finishing up your degree, just chill. You know, Aristotle took about 20 years chilling at the university. Good for him, right? Academia could be a good place if you're doing research and exciting stuff, but it's also patriarchal and racist. Anyways, he stayed there for 20 years at the Academia of Plato, uh, with Plato, studying under Plato. And there's this fabulous, uh, here it is. This is another uh, textbook I use. Uh, luckily, I didn't sign this to you. This is about 200 bucks. This is much cheaper, the other one, right? But look at this uh, painting. I think it's by Raphael, one of those great uh, Renaissance masters. And this is the uh, Academy. Look at these people just thinking away. In the middle, there's two dudes, right? I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of blurry. So one is kind of like a reddish, pinkish robe, and the other one is in the blue. So the one in the, what is it? The one in the blue, that's Aristotle, and the one in the pinkish robe, that's Plato. And I don't know if you could tell, but Plato has his hand pointing to the stars. I don't know if you can see it better there. Ready? The one in the pink, in the middle. He's pointing up to the stars, to the forms. That's Plato. And Aristotle is kind of like looking, kind of pointing towards the ground, towards his, towards the front of his. And this really captures really good, right? I think it captures really well, uh, the difference in approaches to their epistemology between Plato and Aristotle. Where Plato is all about the forms, his ideal, eternal, universal, abstract notions of reality. And Aristotle is more on the ground. Right? He's like this in the painting. Like here, here is where reality is, in front of us, not up there, Plato. Right? So um, just look up that uh, that painting to get a better look. It's called The Academy. 
And I think it's Raphael. I'm almost positive it's Raphael. Or it's one of those great uh, masters from the Renaissance. Right? Not Da Vinci, but Raphael or Michelangelo. One of those. One of those dudes. Right? One of those Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Donatello, Raphael, which one? Right? Um, it's a great painting, though, because it really captures right the, the differences between Aristotle and Plato. Plato is pointing up. Uh, yeah, you can really, you can really tell. And Aristotle is just like there, here. He, this is the reality. Right. <clears throat> so again, Aristotle loved Plato, but he loved the truth more. Okay. Um, all right. So he stays there in Plato's academy for about 20 years, and he leaves like at the age 17, a really tender age. So from the age 17, 18, all the way to his what, 38, almost 40, stays there with Plato, right? Good place to be at, I would say. Um, anyways, uh, Plato. Um, what happens with him? Um, <clears throat> Plato dies in 347. Uh, so I guess you know all natural causes. He doesn't get killed like Socrates. But Plato dies in 347, and Aristotle uh, just leaves Athens, leaves the academy uh, to pursue research, really, to go do some research, you know, abroad. That's what he's doing, and he goes to the to Assos and to Lesbos. These are islands off the Greek mainland, right? Kind of closer to Asia Minor, but in the Mediterranean. And he's doing marine biology. He's studying marine life, right? <clears throat> and he's like just observation, empirical data. It's all he's all about. Aristotle, observation. That's how you're gonna get reality. Observing the particulars in our everyday life. Not about the abstract uh, forms, but here and now. All right, so he does that. Uh, he goes to Assos, he does some marine biology, then he goes to uh, the island of Lesbos. He finds, uh, uh, he meets a girl there, and he, and, uh, what's her name? Um, Pythias, this girl, this woman named Pythias. And they get married, they have a daughter, right? And then in 342 or 343, about five years later, from the when he does when he leaves Athens, the king of Macedonia, where he's kind of where he's from, right, where his dad used to work at as a doctor, the king of Macedonia calls him over and be like, hey man, I have a I have this uh, rowdy young kid, this child Alex, he's a mess, right? Come and tutor him. Right? I need him to keep him at bay, keep him away from trouble. Right, so the king of Macedonia, King uh, King Philip of Macedonia, offers Aristotle a job as a private tutor to this really a fucking annoying kid. Right, he's really uh, brash and really rude and really uh, spoiled, for the lack of a better word. He's a fucking brat. Uh, you'll you'll know him as Alexander the Great, but uh, during this time he's a teenager, and he's a prince. And he knows this. He knows he's going to become king. And you could just imagine a teenager, right, 13, 14-year-old, that knows he's going to control all over this land. You have to tutor him, be a teacher. I feel sorry for Aristotle. But he did that really well, apparently, right? Because look how Alexander became the fucking great. Right? And I argue, some, a lot of scholars argue that, uh, that Aristotle's uh, impact on Alexander the Great wasn't that, wasn't that great, wasn't that much, because he only tutored him for a couple of years two or three years or something, maximum of four years, no more than that. So it couldn't be a big impact. Uh, most scholars argue that Aristotle was sent there just to keep this young kid out of trouble, right? Just like most kids love to rebel against their parents and go into trouble. I was a young, I still feel like I'm young, still getting into trouble. But anyways, right, scholars say that they have this consensus, but I, I want to argue that the other way. I, I think like even if you, even if you just study one year under this great thinker like Aristotle, your mind's gonna change somehow. You are gonna be, you know, inflected somehow with these, with his intellectual greatness of Aristotle. Even when just one semester, right? I had many professors that just one semester and just blew my mind away, completely changed my mind, right? I hope I become that some, uh, professor one day. But I do believe that Aristotle did lay not a key role in the in the greatness of Alexander the Great, but did influence him to become a great military leader, a great person. Right? Well, it depends on what side you're on. If you're on his side, he was great. If you're his enemy, a Persian, then 
like that. But yeah, so anyways, 642, 643 BCE, Aristotle gets a gig as a private tutor to Alexander, who would become Alexander the Great. At this period, he's just Alex, little brat Alex. <laughs> All right. Um, so it lasted about two or three years right there. Um, <clears throat> but another uh, another story was about Alexander's relationship with Aristotle that even continued after this private tutorship. Uh, Alexander was conquering the whole world, the known world at this time. Uh, it was It's told, it's, it's a popular story. It's never been really confirmed by anybody yet. Uh, but it's told that uh, Alexander the Great would send uh, Aristotle just random specimens of these animals he would find out there, like in India or in, in Persia, right? These, these exotic animals for, for Athenians. And he would send them, she would ship them, back to Athens, to Lyceum, to uh, Aristotle's school that he founded, uh, so he could study, right? This hasn't been proven, right or wrong, right? We don't know yet, but, you know, it's, it's probable, right? Um, all right, so, all right, so that happens. Um, and, and at any rate, within six or seven years after he becomes his tutor of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great becomes the king of Macedonia. And he goes on this rampage, pretty much, right? Just controlling the whole world. I mean, he does. I mean, crazy thing about Alexander the Great. Let's go a little bit off topic here. Uh, but Alexander the Great, uh, I mean, he was pretty arrogant, right? I mean, he was con he pretty much controlled everywhere he went. Right? And everywhere he went, he would rename cities. Right? He would rename them after himself. So we have a whole bunch of Alexandrias, right? The city Alexandria, not just in Egypt, but all over, scattered all over Asia Minor, with Turkey, and then into Persia, you know, Arabia, and all that, into in, into India even. Right? He, he stopped there. The Hindu, uh, the Mughal Empire, were the ones that really put a stop on him because they had fucking elephants, <laughs> right? But if it wasn't for fucking elephants, I think, uh, right? The, the Mughal Empire is such a powerful empire as well, right? He would have gone, keep going all the way to China, but he didn't. He stopped right there by the, in India. That was as far as Alexander the Great went. Farther beyond than any European has ever gone. Right. <clears throat> and Alexander the Great, yeah, he was, he, he wanted to keep going, Alexander the Great. He probably would have, right? He, he, he was, a, he was a, held back in India and went towards like Israel and towards like Palestine, all that area. And he just wanted to keep going, wanted to conquer. He was out there for like 10, 15 years or so in the campaign, just going out there. I'm back, right? Not back, not back home. So he had your soldier with him. And you're out there in the middle of fucking nowhere, pretty much, just killing people for 15 years straight. Not going back home, right? Getting a break and watching and, getting, and going back to your family, right? Um, so one time they, they convince Alexander the Great, say, hey, guy, let's take a fucking break. <laughs> we we conquer the whole world now like what else is there to go you know you, know, you want to go to china but that's too far yo like just, just chill for a little while and he did right after this big battle out there in palestine somewhere um he won right alexander the great and his army won um he would always be in the front lines too alexander the great supposedly i'm sure it's true uh, anyways and they fucking partied hardcore for like a whole fucking week straight party hard you know, I could party for like a day or two, maybe, right? Not even. I'm old already. I party for like one day, and like I got to rest for a whole week afterwards. Right? My hangover lasts a whole fucking week. Uh, but this guy parties for a whole week straight, and all his army's getting fucking wasted. And uh, needless to say, he gets a terrible hangover, and somehow he, he, he contracts some kind of disease, and he fucking dies. Alexander the Great dies at the age I think 32 or something. At a very very young age, he dies. Uh, and he died because of fucking partying too much, I would say. Or he got some kind of weird disease out there. But it was, you know, a whole week straight of partying. Your defense is going to be fucking low. All right. So um, there's more of the story here is don't party for a week straight, right? And expect nothing bad to happen, right? Alexander the Great, arguably one of the greatest right leaders ever in history, did that, right? Right? Partied for a whole week straight and he died, right? 
So don't party for a whole week straight and expect nothing good to happen, right? Expect bad shit to happen if we do that. All right. Okay. So let's go back to Aristotle. So Aristotle dies. I mean, Alexander the Great dies. Uh, 340. What fucking year does Alexander? 320, 323 BCE. Alexander the Great dies in 323 BCE. And the Athenians are pissed off. Because these the Athenians were the shit, right? They had control. They had that area in Athens, right? The Macedonians were outsiders. They were barbarians, pretty basically, and they came over and conquered Athens and conquered and conquered fucking Greece and conquered everything beyond that afterwards. And so the Athenians had this resentment growing against anything that has to deal with Alexander the Great or anything Macedonian. Which is that's where Alexander the Great is from. Aristotle is from Stagira, a border town in Macedonia. <laughs> so when he came back to Athens, people have so much resentment, they want to make an example. They charge Aristotle with the, almost the same charges as fucking Socrates. Right? Uh, being unfaithful, not following the um, charges of impiety, basically. Right? So. So even though while Alexander the Great was pretty much pumping money towards the Lyceum, so the Lyceum is this academy that Aristotle, the school that Aristotle founds after Plato dies. So the Lyceum. <clears throat> uh, but once Alexander the Great died, right, all the Athenians wanted to uh, get rid of anything Macedonian, including Aristotle. So the Council of 500 indicts Aristotle with uh, charges of impiety, the very same charges as Socrates had. And Aristotle is very well aware of Socrates. His teacher was fucking Plato, right? Um, and he's like, fuck this. <laughs> I'm not going to stay in Athens and get my ass killed or executed like Socrates. This is what, Arist what Aristotle said. Uh, the Athenians sin twice against philosophy, right? I'm not going to stay here and let the Athenians sin twice against philosophy. The first sin against philosophy the Athenians committed was killing Socrates. The second one, if I stay here, will be killing me. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to leave. And he does. So instead of, uh, he chooses exile, basically, right? And yeah, he's not from Athens, really, to begin with. So he does. He leaves. And then he leaves. Where does he go to? Where where he goes to? Uh, he lives somewhere near the ocean because there's a popular story about Aristotle. He dies like a two years afterwards that he leaves. Or does he do, right? But he doesn't die because of natural cause. Well, he dies he dies because of drowning. So um, this is a popular story that I was going to say. Uh, he he was studying marine life, right, and he drowned. So, so that's a, that's the story of Aristotle. I find it fascinating as hell. The fact that he was a tutor, private tutor, to Alexander the Great. Uh, the fact that he was this marine biologist, right? Uh, oh, and he uh, he married again twice and had a, a, a son, Nicomachus, uh, with uh, when Pythias died, his his first wife, she died, and then he remarried with uh, Herpilis, H E R P I L O I S. And he got a son, Nicomachus, named after his father, Aristotle's father. And when we read about uh, ethics, Aristotle's ethic is basically a book he, he wrote to Nicomachus on how to be a good man. But we'll talk towards the end of this lecture. All right, so that's the story, that's a short biography of Aristotle and, and a little bit of Alexander the Great. So let's go into the actual philosophy, right, the peripatetic philosophy. Of, philosophy, of Aristotle. And this word peripatetic means just walking about. Because that's what he would do, right? That's what these philosophers would do back then. Just walk around and just talk philosophy, right? Just preach to people who wanted to listen. And there was Plato in, with the academy who founded a, a particular institution for this higher learning. And then Aristotle took up that tradition and founded his own school called the Lyceum. L Y C E U M. 
All right. So his Aristotle's logic, uh, his epistemology, right? It's his notion of truth. So like I said, it's totally different from Plato. Right? He's, he's, he's challenging and responding to play to to uh, Platonists, to people that believe in Plato and stuff. Right? <clears throat> uh, so for him, sense everything begins with sense experience. We gotta use our senses to gain knowledge. Right? He is a hardcore empiricist. Right? It's all about our sense experience, senses. Right? The quality of the sense quality, right? The sense quality of stuff. But right? like, as he says, Aristotle in metaphysics, his book Metaphysics. Science and art comes to men through experience. Right? So science and art comes to us via experience. Right? There's this this abstract notion of rationality alone out there in the eternal world of the forms. That's BS, says Aristotle. Right? The really real is just here in us, around us. Okay? Um, and let me continue with this quote. He says again. We do not regard any of the senses as wisdom, yet surely this give the most authoritative knowledge of particulars. So Aristotle is worried, not worried, he's concerned about the particulars, not about the universals. Okay, so let's get that straight now. Uh, he wants to, uh, in other words, he wants to clarify and systematize how we gain knowledge. How we acquire knowledge, okay. and for that, he invents logic, formal logic, uh, which is the study of correct reasoning, right. the structure of correct reasoning. This is what formal logic is, or we also call it categorical logic. Right. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Aristotle did want to find uh, universals. Right, he did want to find this truth, the capital T, but he did not believe that it existed apart from these particulars, like Plato did. Plato has two different; he has a distinction: the particular world of particulars, right, the physical world, right now, and then the world of the forms. For Aristotle, on the other hand, there is no distinction, there is no duality, there is no mind-body split. It's all truth. The really real is in the particulars. We just gotta, for example, turn on the lights in the leaf so we could see around us. Right? And that's reason. Not to transcend our reality, but to really use it to investigate via our senses the things around us, the world around us. <clears throat> so, for example, the. Let's take a chair, for example, right? Or a table. Let's do a chair. Right? Uh, a chair, for instance, right? Uh, you can think about a chair, about all the what it consists of right? wood, right? Maybe some cotton or cloth, right? Uh, you can think about its shape. You can think about uh, its purpose, stuff like that, right? And, and these things, ways, these, these, these causes, as he calls them, that's where you'll find the underlying makeup of reality. Right? Um, it's not right the form of reality, the, the the structure of reality is not based upon this this abstract notion right of the of chair. No, it's it's a chair in front of you. And it's your job as a philosopher, as a scientist really, to take a look, close look at that chair, right, and investigate it and, and try to figure out what it's all about, there in front of you, not some realm out there, in some different abstract eternal world. No, here, here and now. Okay. Uh, so, so Aristotle begins his philosophy, not with this reflection or this dialogue of the forms, right, of these universal entities, but with observations of particular objects. And with this observation, by observing the world, right, this really scientific approach he has here, kind right, of modern science, uh, Aristotle saw these four causes. Uh, 
his four causes. <clears throat> I'm gonna go back to his logic a little bit. Let's talk about the causes now. These four causes um, give you like the underlying principles of what reality is. So think about the pre-Socratics, uh, think about Socrates and Plato. They're trying to figure out these big questions, right? We're talking about metaphysics here. These big questions of what reality is. What is our reality, right? What is the underlying element? What is the, the, the constitution? What constitutes reality, right? What is to be? What is being? Right? These, these, these fundamental questions that begins with Thales, right, with the pre-Socratics, right? goes on to Anaximander and so on. Right? He is also worried about these questions, right? He's concerned about these issues, but he takes a different approach, right? He takes a more systematic approach. Let's use that word. I like that word, systematic. Right? Um, so systematically, critically analyze your observations. So he uh, he developed this, this pretty much these, these systems of how to understand different aspects of our reality, poetics, right, politics, metaphysics, psychology, right, the soul, right, the anima. He has a book called The Anima. Right? This is this is uh, the greatness of Aristotle, right? He creates a whole system of all these disciplines. Which in some are still with us today, right? So he, he's observing the world around him, right? And he figures out there's four causes, or he calls causes, or, or I guess four explanations of reality, right? Or any object out there, every object in reality has four these four causes. And if you analyze, right, and look closely to these four causes, you're going to figure out the final cause, which is like the, the most important one that entails the other ones. And this kind of goes along with his, with his logic, with this with this formal logic setup, which I'll talk in a little bit here. But he has four causes that are responsible for making an object what it is. So the first cause is the material cause, uh, the formal cause, or the material is also called the substance. Uh, there is a so let me just give you two right now: the material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. So let's take the chair that was going on right now. All right, so we have a chair in front of us, and the chair, the material cause, the material is just the material, the substance, right? What is it made out of? Right. Uh, the material of a chair is wood, right? cotton, this cloth, right? That's it, really, right? Maybe some screws, a bit of metal here and there. Or wood glue? I don't know what the fuck, right? Are you, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a carpenter, but I'm guessing. Or I have a table in front of me. A coffee table is wood. There's some. The legs is made out of wood as well. And there's some screws, right? These material costs. Just the material, right? This is the basic material of stuff of an object. The second cost is a uh, is a formal cost. This is the shape of things, the form, the structure. So there's four legs, a flat surface, and a vertical surface for my back. Right? That's the chair, right? Or a table, right? That surface and four legs. That's the formal cause, the form, right? The forma, or the shape of stuff. Um, the other cause is the efficient cause. And this is really like the originator. Who created this? In the case of the chair of this coffee table that I have in me that I'm touching, it'll be our carpenter, right? Or Ashley Furniture. Right? This is where I got this fucking thing from. All right, whoever made this, whoever made that object, that's the efficient cost. Where it comes from, the, the originator, right? the creator of this. And then after the efficient cost, we have the final cost. And the final cost is based upon this notion of teleology, the telos. T E L O S. Has nothing to do with no television, but tello means end or the end point or the end purpose. That's a better way to put it. The end purpose of the chair is for me to sit down on it. Sitting. That's the final cause. Right? The final cause for this coffee table is to put this laptop in front of it right here. Right? That's the final cause of this table. To put books on or whatever you want to put in there. Beer, bong, whatever, 
It's up to you. Right? So these, have, these four causes are what are responsible to make an object, or any object, what it is. However, that final cause uh, entails, right, predicates the other causes, right? Causes the other causes in a sense. Uh, the final cause, the teleology of things, is what's, it's what's going to give you really the final it. Right? It's going to uncover, it's going to tell you what things are for. Right? So the final cause is that for which a thing is made for. Because these, this what a thing is made for determines the other things. If something's made for sitting, you're not going to make a triangle-looking shape chair. Right? Be really uncomfortable. This is a good ergonomic shape form, right? It's also something sturdy, right? It's something durable, right? So wood, right? It's, it's good, right? Yeah, it has a good aesthetic as well, right? Um, right, cloth in the back, right? So it's kind of soft, reclined or whatever. Right? But sitting is the main purpose, and because it's made for sitting. The other causes follow that purpose. That's why Aristotle says that the final cause is the most important cause. But you need all these causes together to know what an object is. That's the key to understanding, right? Is this goal, this end goal, this telos, right? This teleological end goal, right? What is what is the purpose of human beings? He even goes there. He does go there. Right? The purpose of eyes are to see. The purpose of our nose is to breathe, right? To smell. The purpose of our uh, tongue and mouth is to speak, right? ears, so on and so forth. Right? You get the drift here. We go on forever with this. Right? But what is the purpose of a human being? To reach eudaimonia. Right? It's, this, it's usually translated as happiness. But you're going to be careful with this, with this translation because Aristotle had a different view of what eudaimonia is. For Aristotle, eudaimonia, right, this, this happiness, Right, is flourishing is not really a feeling of like euphoria, right? When you're happy, you feel good, right? It's not that. In fact, it's not a feeling at all. Not even a feeling. Eudaimonia for Aristotle is, quote unquote, activity in accordance with virtue. With virtue, right? An activity, a habit, an action that is always in accordance with virtue. That's eudaimonia. That's going to be happiness. That's going to be your, your human flourishing for Aristotle. Right? That's our final cause. That's our telos for human beings is this. Right? So, yeah, we may, we may be made out of right the material of cause of humans, flesh and bones. Right? And there's more than that, right? Your biologist is just way more complicated than that. But just for simplicity's sake, right? Flesh and bones, right? That's the material cause of a human being. What's the shape? What's the formal cause? Head, right? Four limbs, hopefully, for everybody, right? Uh, ten right? fingers and ten toes, right? Two ears, right? Nostrils, whatever, right? The form, right? That's the shape, right? Um, what's the other cause? The efficient. You say your parents. Or you go all the way back to, I don't know, maybe your great, 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 great grandparents or uh, the first human beings that came out of Africa. Savannas, right? From these African savannas, we become the first people, and then they spread all over Europe, all over the Middle East, and then to the Bering Strait and Latin America, right? And that's humans all over the world, right? or God, right? If you want to go there, right? Aristotle doesn't go there. He has a different notion of what God is, and we'll talk about that right now in a little bit. So virtue, right? Right. So we have the material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and then the final cause. This is what makes up our reality. Right? If you could figure out these causes for every object out here, you could uh, you could figure out the underlying reality of things. Right? You don't have to go in and go into the world of the forms. Shit's here in your face. Look at it. Right? And look at it with these different these these, these causes. All right. So that's basically his his. Uh, it's metaphysics. Let's go to his logic. I kind of skipped that. If you're going through the textbook here, but his logic uh, again, he was the inventor. He invented formal logic, right? 
We want to clarify, systematize how we acquire knowledge. Uh, so we call that an argument is a set of statements, premises that support one statement, conclusion, right? Uh, a deductive argument, right? We call that that's supposed to give you certainty, right? For sure, that conclusion should be right or wrong. All right? It's not probably. Oh, it's probably right. Eighty-eight percent chance it's right. No, that's inductive. Deductive is 100% or 0%, no in between. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, so for example, in a valid deductive argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Right? But remember, this is just the structure of the argument. We we'll call it about validity. Right? So if A equals B and B equals C, then C equals A. It follows, right? It demonstrates, right? It, it follows, the logic follows there to reach that conclusion, right? Um, and this is really what he really kind of hones in on, this, this syllogism, right? This structure, this three sentence, three propositional structure of a deductive argument, where you have two statements, right, or two, uh, two explanations, and then a conclusion, right? Or two pieces of evidence, two premises, and then one conclusion, right? All dogs are animals. All animals are mortal. Therefore, all dogs are mortal. Right? So the words, each word in the syllogism is what he calls, what we call categories. So we call it categorical logic. So the, the, the groundbreaking thing that Aristotle did here with logic is basically give us like a kind of like a numeric or algebraic formula for these deductive argumentation which are words. So he kind of transposed the words and added a formula that we could switch whatever words we want, but the structure itself is will stay the same. Okay? So let me kind of explain this, right? So the, this argument that I have right now, all dogs are animals. All animals are mortal, therefore, all dogs are mortal. Could be transposed, translated as all A's, all A are B, all B are C's, therefore, all A's are C's. This is what Aristotle does. He gives us the inner structure of logic, of argumentation. This is called formal logic, the form of our logical uh, progression of our logical actions or illogical, right? And they're invalid, right? So it's not about really about truthfulness, right? Truth content here. It's not about it's not about soundness here, but Aristotle is really fleshing out here is a system of structural the structure behind our knowledge acquisition, formal logic. So it is the inner structure of an argument that determines whether that argument is valid or not valid. Okay. And without, while exploring these uh, syllogisms, right, kind of just applied them everywhere he went, he found out there's a uh, four, I guess, patterns, right? All these syllogisms that he was able to come up with, he found out there's four regular, four general patterns that uh, this kind of formal logic kind of falls under, or follows. Right? These patterns go like this. It's for like four formulas, basically. All S or P, so S here means a subject, and P is a predicate. Uh, if you don't know your uh, basic English grammar here, uh, subject is a noun, name, place, person, thing, or idea, and a predicate is the, the kind of like the verb. What is it doing? I am teaching. I is a subject. And teaching is the predicate, right? And now you have a complete sentence, subject predicate, complete sentence, right? Basic grammar stuff here. This is what we're doing here, right? We're putting, right? We're, we're, we're putting categories in the structure of our logic. So all S are P's. That's one pattern that we could follow. Or another pattern is no S are P's, the opposite, right? Or 
some s are p or some s are not p all right so all the important questions this is what aristotle thought while he was doing his uh his logic all the important statements in science could be reduced to some form of another of these patterns all s are p no s or p some s or p or some s are not p all right and this is really just giving you a more fleshed out formula between the difference of deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning all s or p certain no s or p that's certain the other way some s or p's that's more inductive right not certain some s are not p's right inductive as well right he's, he's grappling with these ideas right he's, of how we get knowledge, right? How do we get knowledge? And for him, it all begins with our senses. And then we apply this logic to clarify and systematize the all the shit that we get, right, from our senses. All the not the shit, the that's not a technical word. All the stimuli, right? That's just we being bombarded with when I open up my eyes and I hear and stuff, right? That's why babies are crying when they come out of the of the of the womb. Right, because they're they're used to this place where it's all like liquefied, right? It's all this liquid and it's kind of muffled, and you can't really see and hear stuff. But when you just come out of there, right? The placenta and stuff, shit's fucking loud and bright, and it's just fucking scary. I couldn't imagine how scary it is for these poor little creatures, right? These little babies. That's why we cry when we're barely born, right? Um, same thing here, right? This this uh, this knowledge here, right? We're investigating what it is around us right we're looking around with our senses right that is uh, epistemology this is how we get knowledge for our subtle our senses and our senses could definitely he does agree yeah they could fool us right if I take out my glasses I'm blind as a bat put them on I could see now better right I could, I could see the website's title the HTML whatever right but nonetheless, this is what we got. It's Aristotle, right? And it's kind of useless to go to this transcendental world of the forms that might not even exist. How do we know that's for sure? Just deal with what you got in front of you, right? Um, so anyways, right? So these all these four patterns, right? You get a total of 256 different valid and invalid arguments with this, these patterns that you figure it out, right? 14 are only valid, 14 of them. But anyway, together, all these distinct uh, valid and invalid arguments, they are uh, they they give you like a system or a compendium. Let's put it that way, right? Let's put it here, compendium of arguments to do or to uh, to uh, emulate or to avoid. Okay? So modus ponens, right? We we see that you know for sure that's going to be a valid argument. This is what Aristotle was uncovering, giving us. Formal logic. Uh, and why? Because for him, the episteme, right, knowledge, it's not really about knowing what things are, but also about why things are that way. And right? that's why for him, the final cause is so important. But that's why also for him, these, these predicates, right, these categories are also really important. Right, so and with these syllogisms, he argues that you could find a lot, you could figure out a lot about the real world out here, with, just with these syllogisms. All right. Um, all right. So predicate knowledge, predicate, the predicate and the subject. Right? Just keep that in mind when, you, when you're reading, when you're doing logic. Right? What is the subject? What is it doing? What is it doing, and does it follow? Right? Is does it demonstrate the conclusion? Do the premises demonstrate what the conclusion says? Right? And if it does, then we say that the argument is demonstrable. Right? So we could arrive at correct explanations of the system of affairs around us right? with the syllogisms, with this categorical formal logic. Right? Uh, Another thing that uh, Aristotle uh, qualifies his logic with, the system of logic, is that he stipulates that 
all this means in the syllogisms, right, these three propositions with the last one being the conclusion, they all must be necessarily true. Right? Uh, this concept of necessarily true, or something that's necessarily truth, uh, is a truth that could not be otherwise, that could not be false. So science is made up of logical sequences of these necessarily true statements or explanations from which we derive necessarily true claims about the world around us. Either way, the result is about a proof. So think about uh, Aristotle's logic, uh, these premises, right, this logism, the two premises and, a, and then a conclusion, just like a mathematical maxim, right, where you have a couple of, like, I guess, rules, and then you have to have a proof. Where you have maxim, a couple of maxims, that's what a maxim is. It's a self-given rule. So if x equals negative 5, and I know some other maxim, and then they give you a formula, and then you got to find the proof, right? When you do calculus and stuff with pre -cal, you do this a lot, right? This is exactly what he's trying to do, but with words now, with language. Fucking cool. Aristotle. All right, but one problem, though, right? So if he says that the premises have to be true, how do we uh, know that they are, in fact, true, these premises? So what are the premises based upon? Right. Now we have to add more premises to prove the premises to be true. And this could go on forever at infinitum. This is what we call a infinite regress. Um, and yeah, he, he admits that, yeah, it's not possible to supply a proof for everything. Right. That's just not possible, right? However, Right, these 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 primary premises, right? These are just intuitive, right? You're just this is what we're, the best we could do, right? It's just intuitive. Right? So, so there is a system here that does have its flaws, again. But nonetheless, the system of logic was the end all be all of logic for about two thousand years. And it's much more complex than what I'm saying here, right? I'm just giving you just a brief overview. Right, and very sketchy of that, of what Aristotle's logic is about. All right, so I mean, so yeah, so so now here let's let's kind of mend his 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 logic, right? His epistemology and metaphysics together. All right, so to go back to the four causes, right? We have the material cause, we have the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. Right? The final cause being the most important one. That is under this concept of teleology, the telos, right? This end point, this end goal, right? But what begins, right? What, what was the, the beginning? What was the efficient cause of everything, right? Right. So for him, compared to Anaximander and Zeno, right? For Aristotle, change is possible. Change is real. There is real change, right? It's not. It's not an illusion. Right? There's different particulars that make change possible. However, what made the first poof, what made the first push to make change? Right? This is what he calls the unmoved mover. Right? This is this is basically what some scholars have called Aristotle's notion of God. Right? The unmoved mover. Right? So what is this unmoved mover? Right? So in, in a textbook definition of this is a, a being that is the source of motion and change in the universe, but that but does not itself move or change or has this original mover, right? This unmoved mover. So kind of think about. Uh, I don't think dominoes is a good. Uh, I guess so. Dominoes right? when you when you push the first one, you put up dominoes up in 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 a sequence. You push the first one and they all fall, right? Around, whatever, however you. That's the unmoved mover, the first push that made everything move, right? He doesn't call it God, right? For him, that's not really the thing. This, this, this is what he is. This, this is exactly what Aristotle says. I think it's beautiful, right? So this unmoved mover, right, it's not really a thing. It's not really an entity, right, like God, right? It's embodied in 
Christ or something. It's not, nothing like that. It's the it's the final cause of everything. It's the telos of everything. And it compels movement through this teleological relationship by being the object of desire or of love for all things in the world. And thus it moves you, right? So you've been in love. I'm sure y'all been in love someday, right? And heartbroken too, right? Uh, but when you're in love, right? You're attracted to this person, and you move towards them, right? You want to be with them all the time, right? You, uh, if they don't uh, acknowledge you, right? You always want them to acknowledge you, right? You move, you're moved by them. This is kind of like the same teleological relationship that Aristotle was thinking with this unmoved mover. It's not a, it's not really a thing. It's not really an entity. It's this love, this, this desire towards eudaimonia. So this is what Aristotle says, straight from the horse's mouth. The unmover produces motion by being loved, and it moves the other moving things. The first mover, then, of necessity exists, and so far as it is necessary, it is good. And in this sense, a first principle. On such a principle, then, depends the heavens and the world of nature. So by, by being this object of desire or of love for all things, that thing in itself does not move, makes everything else move. Right? And I guess, I mean, this does kind of align with this whole Christian notion of God being love. Right? I think a lot of Christians hold on to this notion that God is love. Right? He's not really a, this, this, this person, but it's this notion of love. Right? The same thing with our stuff. This unmoved mover, it pushes you towards this, right? All right. And then, as I mentioned before, what's the final cause of humans? Eudaimonia, right? Which for him is this, uh, to, this uh, activity in accordance to virtue. Right? And you might want to wonder when I mentioned that word virtue, what the fuck do you mean by virtue, Professor Chavez? Uh, so let's explain his ethics, right? This is the best way to explain what virtue is. Because this is where uh, this is what uh, this is the, the backbone of Aristotle's ethics, right? The morality of Aristotle, what's good and right, is based upon this habitual practice of virtuous actions or virtuous activity. Right? So, like I said, uh, Aristotle wrote the Bukian Ethics. This is his main book of ethics for Aristotle, and he wrote it for his son Nicomachus, who was named after his grandfather. Right? And it's really just a, a, a guide on how to be a good man, how to be a good guy. Right? Aristotle wanted to give his son a guide, some rules, on how to be a good person. Right? And now we call this virtue ethics, because virtue is at the, at the center of his uh, ethical decisions. So whatever we do, we say, right, we aim at some good, right, or some aim at some bad. It right? depends on your person. Uh, but for, um, I guess we got to make a, a distinction here really quickly between intrinsic goods and instrumental goods, right? So not all goods are equally the same. Something that is instrumentally good is good as a means, as an instrument to get me some better, greater good, which would that be an intrinsic good? So uh, happiness, right, or honor, right? That's an intrinsic good. It's good in itself. It's intrinsic good, right? It's good for its own sake. Um, happiness, right? Let's think about that. That's good in its own sake. Some people that are materialistic will say, like, oh, a, a big, nice car or a Tesla, right, or whatever, a new car, right? That will give me happiness, right? That car will be an instrumental good, right? It's good to have a new car, no doubt, Especially with the heat outside right now, I gotta have a new nice air conditioner. Um, but it's not an end; it's not good in itself. And it's good to get you to point A and B to keep you cool during the hot summer days and nights. Um, but happiness in itself, right? That euphoric feeling, whatever you want to call it, happiness, that is good in itself. Right? Some people use uh, substances to feel that euphoric movement. Those substances are instrumental goods, quote, 
and that euphoric movement of feeling happy that's good in itself. You, you follow, you desire that good, right? So this is a distinction we've got to make between instrumental and intrinsic good. And for Aristotle, it says that the highest form of the good is intrinsic, right? It's just a eudaimonia. That's what we got to read, eudaimonia. It's good in itself, right? Uh, it's not good. It's not an instrumental good like a good career, right? It's, it's just good in itself. Because right? everything, right, kind of... Everything, um, how can I say? That's like the final cause, right? Everything is that purpose. Everything is done for that purpose. This happiness, says Aristotle. Everything that humans do is done for that purpose. I'll tell those to reach you the moon, that end goal. This is what he says. Let me put it in his own words. Now, such a thing, happiness, above all else, is held to be. For this we choose always for itself and never for the sake of something else, but honor, pleasure, reason, and every excellence we choose indeed for themselves. For if nothing resulted from them, we should still choose each of them, but we choose them also for the sake of happiness, judging that through them we shall be happy. Happiness, on the other hand, no one chooses for the sake of these, nor in general for any other than itself. Right? So that's an intrinsic good. And the uh, most, the highest intrinsic good is happiness. All right, we choose it just for itself. All these other intrinsic goods that we might name, like uh, honor, uh, what do you say, pleasure, reason, all these other really good things, these we use to get happiness. Happiness is the end goal here for everything, for all human endeavors. All right. And how do we reach that happiness? And right. this is what he says: happiness then. Is something complete and self-sufficient. It is the end of action. At the end of action. Action here is a big word here to cling on to. The end of action. So every act you do, every action you take should be aimed towards eudaimonia, towards that happiness that he's talking about. And how do we get there? Through virtuous actions. By becoming virtuous people. All right, so virtue is an inclination, a disposition to behave in line with a standard of excellence. So you have some kind of standard of what is excellent, and you always uh, thrive, always try, right, strive to reach that standard of excellence. Right? So for example, honesty, always being honest, always being compassionate, always being loyal, benevolent, Temperate, right? Being fair, right? These are virtuous characteristics, right? And then if we act in accordance to these virtuous characteristics, our chances of being happy, of finding that end goal, pneumonia, increase. So virtues, in other words, are excellences of character, or character traits. And character traits, right? You need to practice, you need to create a habit. You know, uh, for example, you don't go to the dictionary and look at the word honesty and read all the definition of honesty to know what honesty is. You actually have to practice honesty to really be honest, right? Just because you read a whole essay or a whole book of honesty doesn't make you honest, right? You can read the whole fucking Bible and still not be a religious person, right? Or faithful or whatever, right? You have to actually practice Right, what you preach, right? In layman's terms. Right? It's an it's an act it's an activity. Virtue is an activity that acts in accordance to a standard of excellence. <clears throat> How do we know that we are following that the standard of excellence that we have set up is actually virtuous and not the opposite, right? Vicious or vice. There's different mechanisms to gauge what a virtue is. Okay. One of the most common ones uh, is what we call the moral exemplar. Just a person, an individual that you think is an example of morality. Gandhi, some people say, right? Martin Luther King, right? Or Malcolm X, or whoever, 
doctor, right? Right, if you, or your parents, right? Maybe they're the standard of excellence, or a priest, or who, or somebody you really uh, admire and trust, right? And you want to emulate them, right? So that's what a moral exemplar. That's one way to find out what virtue is, by picking out somebody you think is high, uh, holds a standard of excellence, and you try to emulate their their character. Right? Again, it's activity based, though. Right? You got to constantly, habitually practice these virtues. Another way to find out what a virtue is, is what we call the, what we call the golden mean. The golden mean, right? The golden middle, right? The mean, right? It's a mode, mean, right? The mean, the middle, the middle point here, right? So the golden mean of what, right? So here you take two behavioral extremes, being super blunt, brutally honest, and being a liar. You don't want to be either or. You don't want to be a liar. You don't want to be hurtful, right, to people, being blunt, right, and being rude. You want to find this middle ground, right, honest. Right? Or let's take another example of behavioral extremes. You don't want to be a coward or uh, reckless, right, too, too courageous where you're actually just reckless. Right? You want to find this middle ground where you're courageous, not a coward and not reckless, but actually courageous. Right? Or let's let's look for another one. Uh, what would be another uh, example of the golden mean? Right. Scared, right? Fearful, always fearful, or uh, just blindly just going for it. You know, risky, right? Risking all your life for whatever. For whatever. Got to find a middle ground. That's the golden mean. And in this middle ground, this golden mean, that's where you'll find the virtues. Right, so you take two behavioral extremes and look for moderation. Basically, moderation is virtue for Aristotle. All right. And basically, these, this is his, I mean, I won't go over into his ethics uh, much more than this. I just want to kind of give you an overview. If you really want to go into his ethics in a more uh, detailed manner, I suggest you take my class, my ethics class. We'll go into ritual ethics in much deeper level and analysis in this. Just kind of want to expose to you to the playing field of here, right? virtual ethics. Ethics, right? What 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 makes something right or wrong is if it's based upon a virtuous activity, right? And this is a habitual thing. It's a habit, right? It's not a formula you put. It's something you gotta construct and create. Character here, virtuous character. It's gonna. It's, it's goal oriented. It's not rule oriented. There's no rules you gotta follow. Right? There's no Ten Commandments or there's no uh, categorical imperative. There's nothing like that. It's just habits that you gotta hone in for yourself, based upon standards of excellence. Right? It's habitual. It's goal oriented. It's not rule oriented. Right? It's aspirational. Right? You aspire to become a better person. You just don't follow rules and be a better person. That's not as simple as that. Right? Ethics is a lifelong project. Right? Being a good person is a lifelong project. All right, this is the end of chapter five. I hope you enjoy uh, Aristotle. Chapter six, uh, perhaps my favorite chapter of the textbook is uh, what Louis Vaughn here, your uh, author of the textbook calls Eastern Thought. Not really too excited for that for that title. The chapter itself is great because we're gonna we're gonna be talking about for for now for not about non-Western philosophies. It's not thought. It's not really just thinking. These are philosophical systems that were developed by non-Western peoples that were arguably even much more sophisticated than what we've been going over thus far. So chapter six is about non-Western philosophy, which is a big chunk of what philosophy is. It's the other half, right? Unfortunately for us, we live in a Western world. Thus, we fixate on Western philosophers, right? European philosophers. But it's important to know that non-Europeans, people of color, were doing amazing philosophical work, even at the same time as the pre socratics and Socrates and Cato and Aristotle. All right, that's chapter. That's the next chapter. So I'm excited for that. Go over Hinduism, Buddhism, 
Taoism, and we'll end up with our Aztec philosophy, Mexica philosophy, which is right down the border here. All right. Y'all take care, stay safe, wash your hands, and please wear their mask.